Hi there. This is a screenshot um, that's designed for a diploma program higher level students studying history. Um, it's designed for the Paper 3 course, um, which will cover the Middle East and Africa. And we're looking at the first bullet point for Topic 17 on the higher level, the Middle East since 1945. Um, the materials in the PowerPoint are based on my own knowledge and the book, The Middle East by Michael Scott Barman, which is the Active History series, and some notes that I took from an online lecture by the um, online university Coursera. Um, it's not intended to um, present an argument or a case. I'm trying as best as I can to give um, an objective overview of the incidents that led to the British withdrawing from Palestine by 1948. Um, I'm assuming that you've studied the Middle East between the wars, um, so make sure that as you set the context for topic 17 that you're aware of modern Zionism and the ideas and work of Theodore Herzl that was emerging in the late 19th century and that idea that begins to establish um, Jews around the world and particularly the Jews of Europe as a political nation a national people not just a religious community um, and remember all those challenges from the different kind of theories and ideas about Zionism and the disagreements within the movement itself so it's not a monolithic kind of demand for a Jewish nation states but there were spiritual Zionists there were people that had um, a variety of different ideas. And in many cases, it was a response to the anti-Semitism that existed in Europe and was really evident at the start of the 20th century, particularly the Kishinev pogrom of 1903 and that idea of need for self-defence. Of course, there is a response from the Arabs particularly and there's um, that idea that... Um, since the sort of collapse perhaps of the um, Ottoman Empire that there's definitely um, weaknesses perhaps perceived in the sort of the, some of the Muslim societies that are going on. So the Zionist project might well be perceived as the kind of um, extension of Western expansionism. So of course as you remember you've got the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and the what it actually said, what was understood, and those that all-important kind of interpretation and misinterpretation that will go on. So that's another key element of what's happening here in the mid-20th century. Of course, at the end of the Second World War, at the end of the First World War, the status of Palestine shifts again as it becomes a mandate of the British, and there's the whole element there of mandates, the role of the League of Nations, and looking at France and Britain as um, colonial powers in the region. As you know, there's continued resistance from the Palestinians and local Arabs to the Jewish settlement. There's those key riots in 1929, as well as the extended Arab resistance and through the Arab rebellion in 19, between 1936 and 1939, which in some ways also, remember, kind of backfires a little bit. Um, and it's there to kind of aiming to bring an end to the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. So with all that going on, um, there's... The British, as you know, introduced the Peel Commission and the Partition Plan in 1937. And, of course, that leads to the British White Paper of 1939. So there's quite a lot going on here. And remember, of course, that Peel, kind of, he kind of comes up to the idea that partition is the solution. That's the beginning of that idea of that division. And, of course, when we get to the White Paper of 1939, that really is seen by many Jews as a, um, the abandonment of the British support for sort of Zionism, when the British are proposing to restrict Jewish immigration into Palestine, restrict land to Jews, and that also promising Palestinian independence within 10 years, by which time, remember, the Jews probably still wouldn't have a demographic majority if um, immigration was going so that way. So that's where we are in 1939. But do remember, of course, that there is growing sympathy for the plight of the Jews in Europe as it's becoming more apparent, but of course, not yet entirely obvious what um, the Nazi plans for the Jews will be in terms of the final solution. So that's something else for you to bear in mind during this complex period. During the war, of course, and Susser points out in his lectures that the different roles of Jews and Arabs in World War II will have a massive impact on their different causes after the war. So how both sides in the um, issue will behave during the war will have a direct impact on international sympathies for them after the war. Um, there's generally a fair amount of Arab sympathy for the Germans. The, the Mufti himself... Um, 
will um, spends part of the war in Berlin and is seen to be cooperating with the German war effort. And this will have a huge impact on his own personal and international stature after the Second World War. Perhaps naturally, with the plight of Jews worsening in Europe throughout the 1930s, the Jews of Palestine will support the Allied effort against the Germans. So many Jews will join the British army. Um, about 36,000 Palestinian Jews volunteer to join the British army. And as well as that, the Palmach has set up a fighting force um, in May 1941. And the first Jewish brigade in the, Germ in the British army, excuse me, is set up in 1944. So Britain is now supporting the formation of new Jewish military forces. But remember, the Jews are still fighting that 1939 white paper, but they're also hoping that their support for the British in the military cause against Germany, you know, with an eye on the future, will be able to help them out there. In the meantime, whilst the war is going on, there's perhaps a shift of focus um, from the sort of international power that could help the Zionist cause the most from the British to the Americans. And in May 1942, um, at the Biltmore Hotel in New York, a Zionist conference is held, and its outcome is called the Biltmore Declaration, because that's the hotel where it's held. Um, they demanded Palestine as a Jewish commonwealth, and it's the beginning now of a shift to um, the Zionist cause looking to America to become the key supporters of the Jews in Palestine. And obviously, then the influential role of European um, European Jews is fading now as their lives are being destroyed and it will be the USA that becomes the key centre. Um, there is an increase in Jewish immigration to Palestine at this time. By 1945, the population is up to 500,000 and they're expanding an agricultural and industrial base there. Um, Britain is still reasonably hostile to the demands of the Jews in Palestine. Um, and, of course, it will be the Holocaust and the events after 1945 when the extent of the Holocaust is revealed that begins to shift things. Britain is still keen to maintain um, relations with the Arab states through this time and proposes in 1942 the first a meeting to set it up is in 1944 and the Arab League is formed in spring 45. So Britain's still trying to limit um, Jewish immigration to Palestine. They need the Middle East and oil. They want to maintain their friendship with the Arab nations and they're hoping that relations in the Middle East can be improved with the alliances of new the new Arab states that are forming. But in this new international context by spring 1945, it's pretty clear, you know, who are going to be the key players in the post-war world. And it's, you know, the old colonial powers of Britain and France are certainly in decline. So as we've already seen, there's international influence on the Zionist movement as well as on the fate of Palestine and the Arabs within it. Um, President Truman himself was initially concerned about the creation of a religious state, but he was also fairly clear that emigration to the US perhaps was not the answer. He was interested and concerned by the fate of the Jews of Europe and very concerned about the desperate state of many um, Holocaust survivors, many of whom, of course, were in displaced Persian camps at this time. Um, and here we have now a shift, and it becomes very important, and this has been the case since before the war as well, that the Arabs, it becomes very urgent indeed for them to sort of detach the Palestinian question from its European context, that the um, Arabs should not have to answer for the solution to a European problem. And that, of course, becomes absolutely impossible. But that, that idea there that had existed before the war is still there very very much after the war and perhaps um, something to think about when you're thinking about the organisation of the Palestinians, the organisation of the Arabs, that they really failed to get that message across diplomatically. Um, as we've already seen, um, the balance of power is shifting against the Palestinians by the end of the war, by 1945. The British announced that they're not changing their Palestinian immigration policy, however, um, the Zionists will begin to respond with active opposition to the British rule. So there's a number of things happening um, that you could interpret either way, really. Um, as we've seen earlier, the Mufti support for the Germans certainly doesn't help the Palestinian or Arab case here. Um, but the British are still trying to limit Jewish immigration, um, and, there's, and they're now coming under threat from organised armed um, 
Jewish underground groups, some of which, of course, were funded by support from the USA. So there's a shift in the balance of power. And although the British are sticking to their Palestinian immigration rules, it's not really going in the favour of the Palestinians. Um, in 1946 then the British had had commissions of inquiry before but in 1946 perhaps acknowledging also the emerging role of America as a, as a player in the Palestinian question an Anglo-American um, committee of inquiry is launched um, and it kind of shows us a little bit how far things have changed and the admission from the British perhaps that the Americans will be needed cooperation is needed. Um, the, the committee members here, um, delegations from both sides, um, the, the Arabs are very clear, they reject the Balfour Declaration, they want an end to Jewish immigration and they want their own majority state. The Zionists of course are demanding statehood and um, Weizmann acknowledges that the creation of the Jewish state would cause injustice to, Palest to Arabs in Palestine and but he believed the non-creation of the Jewish state would be the greater injustice. The European context, perhaps as I said earlier, for the failing of um, Arab diplomacy is maintained. Committee members do visit Palestine, but they also visit displaced persons camps in Europe. And the committee eventually recommends a binational state and the admission of 100,000 Jewish refugees. Not acceptable to the British and it's not acceptable to the Zionists and it's not acceptable to the Arab population either. Um, there's a huge response in terms of what the Zionists begin to do, and there's an increase in Jewish terrorism. There's a number of case studies there that you'll need to become familiar with. Um, the King David Hotel bombing is probably the most famous, but the Night of the Bridges itself um, basically is a pretty impressive coordination feat. There's up to 50 kind of mock um, attacks made and the Haganah managed to successfully bomb all of the bridges into Palestine. So it's pretty dramatic um, information there for them. Um, but a propaganda tool is also used as Holocaust survivors and the sort of displaced Jews of Europe um, are illegally emigrating into um, Palestine and it's really used as a tool to try and embarrass the British. Um, they kind of they ship refugees that would be stopped by the British and then are deported back to internment camps in Cyprus and some of them were even sent back to Germany so it just really um, kind of any kind of international sympathy Britain might have for trying to balance the Arab and Jewish populations in Palestine kind of goes out the window that is damaging to the British policy. Um, in this kind of context then, in this kind of environment, Britain decides, and it had approached the United Nations before, this isn't like a sort of snap decision, but this sort of the increase in criticism and of course the cost and expense of keeping 100,000 British soldiers there, the police force and the ongoing troubles. In May 1948, the British hand over the Palestinian question to the United Nations. So I hope this has been useful for you. Thanks for watching. And um, if you've got any thoughts or comments or anything else that um, you're interested in, then please leave a comment. Thanks for watching.